This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 786. Oftentimes we look at the moving the wall. We look at some big project. Like I got to do this big thing. I got to get good at real estate. I got to build financial freedom. And it's a big wall. It's a lot of rocks there. It looks heavy. But the fact is, it's not heavy. It's 20 pound rocks. Anybody can do it. So maybe people need to focus a little bit less on the wall and more on the rock. Mm-hmm. What's the next rock in front of you? What's the little, the 20 pound rock? It's not, it's not light. 20 pounds is still a little lift, but anybody can do it. A kid can do it. You just move the rock across the field. Yeah. Before you know it, you got a wall over there. You got a new fence. What's going on, everyone? This is David Green, your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, here today with a special Seeing Green episode for you. If you haven't listened to one of these before, these are episodes where we take questions from you, our listener base, our fan base, the people that are trying to build wealth through real estate, and I answer them for you based on my experience or the perspective that I have with real estate. Well, sometimes I bring in help, and today is one of those shows. I've got my best friend, Brandon Turner, with me, former host of this same podcast you're listening to right now, that really helped me get started in the space, and he's going to help me tackle the questions that our listeners have asked. This is going to be a fascinating show. I'm excited to bring it to you guys today. Now, I don't want to give away any secrets from today's show because it was really fun, but I will tell you I'm about to teleport myself to Hawaii and bring this show to you live from the sea shed. So I'll see you in a minute. From flannel to full-time flip-flops, DIYer to visionary, hot chocolate only to coffee connoisseur. He's traded cold climates and ice cream every night for sun surfing and triathlons. Please welcome none other than my brother from another mother and best friend, Tandon Burner. That was the most ridiculous introduction I've ever had. I loved it. Thank you. It's not bad. That's really good. Did you write that or did Eric write that? Eric wrote that. Absolutely. Did did, Did Eric write that or did AI write that? Uh, that's a better question, which we probably shouldn't get into on this episode right now because we'll be talking about it for the whole time. Brandon and I are staunchly opposed on opposite ends of the AI spectrum. He loves it. I hate it. Uh, he thinks that it's going to be cute and fun. I think it's going to be the Terminator that takes up the world. No, I think both. Skynet is Genesis. Both. You heard it here first. Take over. Take over, man. So before we get into the show, can I tell you a funny story? I don't know if I've already told you this, but we're going to do it on the podcast. Okay. Uh Uh, Somebody DM'd me asking for marriage advice Mm. because he was going through divorce and he wanted to know how can I make sure that my wife doesn't get all the assets? And I'm like, "Eh, that's not really a question I'm going to answer for you, buddy. You need a lawyer and I don't feel comfortable telling you how to screw over your ex-wife. So instead I said, well, what can you do to save the marriage? Let's talk about that. That might be a little bit better. Marriage is sort of under attack in our country and I'd rather see couples stay together than get divorced. And he didn't want to get into that conversation, but I'm like, well, you know, I've been through a rough breakup and I thought at the time that I could handle it. It was actually much harder than what I thought. You might want to really think about this because sometimes when you're frustrated, you're emotional in your mind, you see a situation working out differently than how it actually works. Like, have you ever quit a job based on impulse? Probably not you, but people have. And then wake up the next day, like, why did I do that? I don't have another job. There's nothing lined up. And his reply was so not like I would expect this guy to answer that I asked him, did you send that from chat GPT? <laughs> and the answer was yes. Yep. He he gave me a uh, computer generated answer about me pouring my heart out in an Instagram <laughs> DM. And I'm like, this is why I do not like AI because that's what people are going to do. They're like, okay, how do I say something to my wife on our anniversary that's going to really make her happy? And you're going to go to chat GPT and say, say something really sweet for my wife. And then you're going to hand it to her. I may or may not have done that recently on our, uh, what was it? My wife's birthday. And I need a nice birthday message for her on Facebook to be like, Hey, that's my wife. So I went on to chat GPT and, uh, I put in all my thoughts and I said, can you make this sound better? And it made it sound better. At least you put your thoughts in. I'll give you that. Other people are using it to save time so they don't have to think, which Mm -hmm. is what scares me. And it's a sickness of the highest order. I don't like it at all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we not talk about it then, man? Because you don't want to talk about it. So no, I want to talk about you. We're we're back in Hawaii. (laughs) We're, uh, we're doing our thing. We've got, I've got my AI disclaimer out of the way. So there will come a point where you and I will be pitted against each other, like celebrity deathmatch on MTV over this AI thing. And we'll see how that works out. But, uh, in today's episode, Brandon Turner and I have, what's the word I'm looking for when you come back in contact with someone reconnected? Reconnected? That's not the word I was looking for. I don't know. We'll call it that. Sorry. It's a joyous I, reunion. Uh, yeah, something like that. Like it's you know a reunion. Chat GPT Reunite. and say, uh, open AI. What is another word for? Watch this. What is another word for reunion? Another word for reunion is gathering more. Here are some more meeting, get together, gathering, rendezvous, assembly, and homecoming. Thank you, ChatGPT. So see, we, see how fast that was? Yeah, it, well, it probably was as fast as we could have just figured it out. <laughs> 
<laughs> without having to type. But until ChatGPT is inside of our brains through a Neuralink, we mm. still have to think a little bit. Give it a year or two. So I'm back with Brandon in the sea shed, and we are talking in today's episode. We are going to get into uh, a, like a fire round of questions Uh-oh. that people want to know about us. That sounds good. We are going to get into a, uh, as an ode to the old BP style, a fire round, round. where I'm going to fire questions at you, many of them from uh, some of our listeners, and see what you have to say. So question number one. That sound effect. It'd be like, fire round. Pew, 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 pew. It was something kind of like that. It was like explosions. Yeah. But I'm thinking like the the little pew, pew, pews. I don't know that that's still cool, brother. (laughs) I think that's like a nine-year-old meme. Pew, pew, pew. It was very funny at the time, though, especially working in law enforcement. Pew, pew. There's like pew memes going around all over the point. Question for you. Okay, here we go. What happens when you fart in church? Oh, jeez. What? Yeah. Is that a joke or is that a question? No, that's a joke. Oh, okay. What happens? They make you sit in the pew. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Getting into our eyes. Did you make that up or did you hear that? I heard it sometime a long time ago, but you brought it back. That's a good joke. Your punis. I'm going to list off the types of my boats in my armada. What is your favorite and how would you rank them in order of importance? You've got the friendship, the relationship, and the partnership. Friendship, meaning what do I care more about? Friendship, which is most influential in someone's life, friendship, relationship, or partnership? How are they different? Well, I don't know. You explain to me. I would think they're different. Like, okay. are you? I'm I'm best friends with my wife. I have a relationship with my wife, and my wife's my partner. So she's you and I are person. you and I are friends. We're relationship. We're partners. Um, but we don't. We're, well, business partners. Okay, so this would be a romantic relationship. Okay, so romantic relationship, friendship, partnership, friendship. business partnership, business. Okay, so business partnership, romantic relationship, and. Uh, friendship, bro, bromance. Yes. <sighs> Most influential in someone's life. What are they? What's the big rock they want to get right first? The romantic all day long. Okay. You cannot, uh, you cannot grow beyond. Maybe you can, but it's it's exceptionally hard to grow beyond the person you pick to spend your mm. life with. Uh, if that's wrong, uh, there's a great quote. Who said that? I'm gonna. Oh no, Pete Vargas. He's a he's a speaking coach kind of guy at a big company. He once uh, told me that his dad would always say. Was it Pete? I think it was Pete that said this. I'm going to give him credit anyway. Uh, I'm Daniel just glad Grothy. you're giving credit to someone else for a thing you're about <laughs> A wise to say. man once said. It might, actually might have been Daniel Grothy who wrote a great book called The Power of Place. But the, the, either way, the quote was they were together. That's why the three of us were together when I heard this. They said, when everything's right at 123 Main Street, like their house, everything's right. Right? When everything's right at home, mm. everything else is right. Mm-hmm. When everything's wrong at home, everything else is wrong. Therefore, romantic partner, number one most important thing. Get that right. Pick that the takes right up person, so much real estate in your it. head, right? It takes up so much real estate. When things are wrong in your relationship, you're not working out. You're not thinking about real estate. You're not doing a lot of things. You're in you're survival gonna, mode. You're in it. survival mode. That's good it. Good point. Right? Yeah. So that's why I go. That's really good. Jay Papazan at your Better Life Conference kind of seconded that when he was mm. talking about, I am a husband first, then a father, then a business person. Yep. If I get those first two right, all the other dominoes tend to fall in line. So that's very good. Okay. After a romantic relationship, friendships or business partnerships, most influential. I can't separate them. I don't have friends that That's, are You are partners, that way, actually. Your friends, friends, friends become your business partners and your business life are your friends. That's a yep. great point. I'm not sure I have any friends that I don't do some kind of business with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure I do. I like, there's some people from like church, That's for example. Thought, man. I've never thought about that. Mm. Do you have a lot of friends that aren't business related? And this is like, mm, yeah. I have a hard time. I, just, I mean, let's be real. I have a hard time connecting with people that aren't in my world of business. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean they do what I do, mm-hmm. but they're at the same mind. Because your business mindset. is so tied to your mission. That's why. Yeah. For you to have a friend outside of your business means they're also kind of outside of your mission in yeah. life. That's so important to you. Yeah. When you get around people and you've been around people like, man, my bosses won't give me that raise and I've been working like 40 hours a week and they're like, they're not giving me a raise. It's so stupid. Like, how how do I even like... How do I re- how do I resonate with that? I can't. Yeah. Like we don't... We're, we're operating at very different frequencies. Yeah. Right? And so... And I don't want to, I don't want to be in that frequency. Right. So I almost don't want to be around. Now there are people I'm friends with, I guess that I'm not in any kind of business thing. Uh, however, they are in some kind of business thing usually. Yeah. So they're operating at a similar frequency. We're all, we're all running on the same frequency. Yeah. That's a great point. All right. Our first question is going to come from the new co-host Rob Abasolo in the H. This is what, what the, the, H- the new people in Houston refer. It used to be called H Town. They thought they were cool to call it that. H Town kind of became cheesy, so now they call Rob it lives in Houston? the H. Yeah. How did I not know that? I thought he was in like California. He used to be in LA for a time, he's but he's like, in Houston. He, but he's one of those guys that bounces around like wherever he's investing. He wants to go live there, mm. but he's in Houston now. He's investing in Houston? 
I believe it's, he is. I'm buying. You like, are too. I got two huge apartments right now that I'm buying. Yeah. I mean, so Rob, if you ever need yeah. a place to live, hit up I Brandon. Have he could probably thousands, get you a discount on that rent. Yeah. Mm. Rob's question: How has raising funds in the recent months changed for you? What are some <laughs> tips that you may have for vetting operators? It is the hardest time in the history of me being in real estate in 20 years, almost of raising money and raising mm. capital. And I would include that in being like 07. Not that I was doing a lot in 07, 08, mm-hmm. but man, it is t- it is tough right now. What makes it tough? A mm, couple things. Number one, uh, the news <laughs> makes things tough, right? Consumer confidence is what drives a lot of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the news has made it very scary. Recession's coming. Recession's coming. The real estate's going to crash, even though there's almost no data that supports a real estate's going to crash. But everyone, the news likes, yeah. to, likes to say that. There's very little that like that would. Why is it going to crash? Because it happened before. Yeah, exactly. Like people cannot think outside of what happened before. Yeah. That's all they can think is, is did this before. Humans need patterns. Yep. Right, because our to brain feel safe. to feel safe, they need patterns. So the way that especially we when eighty percent of the real estate in our brain is not safe, yes, we look for the comfort in the pattern, yes. and we miss what is actually happening. Yeah, there's a whole. Uh, I mean, books have been written on this topic of humans have to co- categorize things and find patterns and find meaning in things. Oh, for sure. Have you ever dated somebody who like their father left their family when they were younger? I guess no, because you've only dated one person yeah, your true. entire life. But <laughs> this will come up with somebody who like uh, another one of my best friends, Kyle. He lost a job out of nowhere. Mm. He he just got married. He started a job with another other coach, that coach committed a moral indiscretion and was fired from the job, which meant Kyle was fired with him, even though he did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And it set this pattern in his life of you can't ever feel safe Mm -hmm. at any minute. The hammer is going to drop on you, right? Or someone who who was left by a romantic partner, they were left by a parent. They have this belief that people always leave. And what's crazy is they now find a way to make that a self-fulfilling that prophecy uh-huh. that they push people away yeah. to say, well, I wanted to hurt you before you hurt me, or I wanted to leave you before you left me. And then they end up using that as confirmation bias to support a, see, everyone leaves. Yeah. See, you'll never, like he, that person won't commit to a job. That's not the case in Kyle's case, but that's because we've talked about it a ton. He easily could have been in, I'm going to quit this job before I lose it. Yeah. And I think the same thing happens with the real estate stuff. People, It happened before, it's going to happen again. And so they don't go invest in real estate. Meanwhile, when I look at the market, I don't know if you think the same, but we very well could be going into a recession. I think we're probably in a recession, but inflation masks that a lot of the time. But all the money is flooding into real estate. It is the safest place to put your money right now. Yeah, let's also remember, because again, people have bad memories, but and maybe they don't know the data, but I think it's like seven out of the last eight recessions, real estate went up. It was only the 07, 08, 09. Because that recession was based on- That was a real estate recession, yes. Yes. So when people think recession, they think real estate recession. Yes, Uh, because that's the most recent- Because that's that's in their memory and that's all we can remember, right? So the fact that most recessions, almost all of them in American history have been good for real estate investors. That said, I love the point you made. I'm going to bring it even broader. Sometimes if you focus so much on that, like you said, the self-fulfilling prophecy comes through, we could see a real estate recession yeah. and we're going to make it happen to ourselves because we're all freaked out. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen because I think there's so many people waiting right now because of the bigger pockets effect. We, we, I mean, we yeah. changed America in terms of real estate. Uh, there are millions of people looking for deals. The second there's a deal, people are going to are going to fill that gap. Uh, and so we've got a long time before I think we're going to see a collapse. But it, so there's two points I'd make there. Are, it is very true that it could happen because we do it to ourselves. And that makes me think about, well, if it does happen, it won't last forever. Yep. Right. It makes me think about there are times where just by sh- pure sheer force, you can hold a beach ball underneath the ocean. Yeah. But at a certain point, your arms get tired. What happens yep. when you let go? Yep. Sh- shooting right back up. And the further down you pushed it, the faster and the higher it comes right back up. We, we need an analogy button. Just boom. Boom. Bing. Yep. Yeah. So when you do see something like all the investors get scared and so they all sell their real estate and that floods the market with supply, like what we saw in 2010. Yes, that can happen. But at some point, people like investors realize, oh my God, this thing cash flows so easy. Let's go buy it. Yeah. It turns around just as fast as it went bad and it goes shooting right back up. The other thing, my opinion, I can't prove this, but I think real estate has always been from a financial perspective, not from an easy perspective. It's probably a more difficult asset class to invest in compared to stocks or other things you can just go buy, but it's always been the best. And it reminds me of jujitsu. Jujitsu was always around. Karate Ding. was always around. Sumo wrestling was always around. Wrestling was always around. Uh, taekwondo was always around. But you didn't know which one was the best because whoever you talked to was a sensei in that thing and they always yes. thought theirs was the best. And then the ultimate fighting championship came around and we actually pitted all of the different martial arts against each other. And it became very clear that this little guy doing jujitsu is beating all of the big guys doing other things. And we had objective evidence to see it was better. And then the popularity of jujitsu exploded. Bigger pockets sort of function like the UFC. We started to see everyone's learning this 
tool now. Everyone's learning jujitsu. It's going all over the place. And then as they start comparing their investing vehicle versus the other people's, real estate's blowing everyone away. Now everyone wants to train jujitsu. It used to be a secret. If you knew that, you could beat up the big guy. Well, now the big guy knows it too. And Blackstone in this case is the big guy who's going to go in there and buy it all up. So what I've been telling people is I am more worried that you will not take action, that there's not enough urgency about how valuable buying real estate is, and you will miss out on an opportunity to buy it, period while they're waiting for this huge crash that's going to come so that they can get it even better. Uh, I don't want to get too far off our questions, but do you think that I'm being a little too greedy in my perspective that real estate is more likely to become too expensive for people to buy than it is to crash and become more affordable and people should wait to jump in? No, I agree. I think it's, I think it, I think given a long enough horizon, real estate's always going to be more expensive. And so uh, now I also think rents are going to go up. I mean, you made, you made the brilliant point uh, this weekend we were talking that, 30 years ago, a house was 20 grand, you know, in some areas. Yeah. And now it's 200 grand. Yeah. So that means if today, if it's 200 grand, it might be 2 million in, in 30 years. Logically, now. it would or, be. Yeah. Or even more because of all the money. Because we're printing more money. So at the same time, rents that were $200 a month are now $2,000 a month and they're going to be $20,000 a month potentially. Uh, and so it, it flows together. Um, it's like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, grandpa's like, when I was a mm-hmm. kid, you could buy a house for $12 yep. and a pack of smokes. It's like, yep. And, and, Every, yeah, and everyone thought that was crazy. That house would be a thousand dollars. When I was a kid, you yep. could buy a house for two hundred thousand dollars. Exactly, exactly. And so, the more we can lock in debt today, the more we can lock in good, good debt, even at seven or eight percent. I don't care as long as you can lock in good debt. Yeah, it's good stuff though. Yeah. It's really good to be thinking that way. I, you notice in our position as people who are teaching real estate and have to pay attention to it, there's certain facts that that people like to grab a hold of and there's other ones that are uncomfortable and they dismiss it. So you'll often hear it said cash flow is guaranteed but appreciation is just icing on the cake. It's yeah. probably not going to happen. But you look back over 30 years was appreciation just it happened to happen or was it pretty predictable? Exactly. And then when you try to live off your cash flow as someone like us that's done it before, it's actually wildly unpredictable. Yes. You never know when the thing's going to break, the tenant's going to leave, the problem's going to occur. And then everyone accepts that appreciation could happen for the price, but we never think about the fact that it happens for rents too. Yeah. Appreciation applies to rents. Yes. Rents go up over time while the mortgage stays the same. That's what makes real estate make sense. Your loan balance stays the same. Your value of your home goes yeah. up. Your mortgage stays the yep. same. Your rent goes up. Over time, this always happens, yet there's this consistent message of, well, don't bank on that. Don't bet on that. And we're not telling people to go out there and get yourself in the hole two grand a month buying a property that you can't afford. No one would say that, but just let's quit pretending like appreciation in rents and prices and stuff is an accident that just happened. Like it's not predictable that that's going to continue. Yeah. Agreed, man. Agreed. But to to continue the topic real quick about raising capital. Yes, it's hard right now. Right. But this is how, this is where my mind goes with that. Let's just say half as many people are willing to invest in, let's say, open door capital right now. Like we're, we're doing a big raise right now. Let's say half as many people are interested. And out of those people, let's say they're only investing half as much. Okay. So now it's literally four times harder to raise capital than it was before, which is probably about where we're at. Okay. So we have two options. You can shut down and you can say, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to raise as much capital. I'm going to lower my goals. Uh, my buddy in high school, Corey would always say, if you can't reach your goals, lower your standards. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> not good advice. That's funny. Yeah. Like he was talking about that in terms of hitting on girls. I had a friend that had the same thing with hitting <laughs> yeah. on girls. And he used to say, what did he always say? He said something like lower your average, lower your standards, raise your average. Yeah. The same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can choose to do that if you want to, but instead I just said, ask the question, how do I get in front of four times many people? And so we started advertising on Facebook and Google and YouTube. And I went and I started going on more podcasts and I started instead, I took a problem, identified the problem. And then I asked, how do I overcome that problem? Let's really look at it and dissect it that way. And so if somebody's trying to raise capital right now, whether it's you're trying to find one hard money lender to fund your flip and there's half as many hard money lenders and they're, they're turning you down twice as much. It's four times harder to get hard money. Okay. Apply for four times as many hard money loans. If you're trying to raise money from a family or friends, or you're trying to get a bank to finance your your deal or an FHA loan to house hack, I don't care. And it's harder. Don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Right. That's a famous quote as well. Do the weights get lighter when you lift them? Yeah. No, no. Well, wait, what? They feel lighter, but the weights aren't actually becoming lighter. You're becoming stronger. Yes, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm like, so that's raising capital right now. That's important. Um, on the LP side, let me just speak to those people who are who have money right now and are thinking about investing it, but you're nervous because it is it's a scary time, quote unquote, right now. 
First of all, it's always a scary time. There has never been a time, even when it was easier to raise capital, everyone's like, oh, we have it. A recession's coming anytime. They've been saying that for eight years. You remember a podcast we interviewed a guy years ago, not to call him out, I won't even say his name, but years ago who, I mean, this is like 2011 maybe. And he was like talking about the musical chairs. And he's like, look, like we're going to go into another recession probably. I don't need it. It's like the real estate's a game of musical chairs and everyone's dancing and having a good time right now. But you know what? Chairs are being pulled away and- uh, the music's just going, but there's fewer and fewer chairs. So you know what? I don't have to be the last one to get a chair. I'm going to sit down right now and I'm going to just watch the people dance. Mm. And then the, the light's going to come on, the music's going to stop, everyone's going to scramble for a chair and a bunch of people are going to lose. But I'm going to just sit down and watch. That was 2011. What did this guy miss out on? Like we didn't see a double dip. He missed out on 10 years. Maybe he got back into it. I don't even know the story. No, but theoretically, if he followed his own advice, yes, he li- he missed out on yeah. more. Pro- the biggest run we've biggest ever, run seen ever seen in housing prices yes. because of all the money that was printed. Correct. And so he, again, we make the best decisions with the data that we have. I yeah. understand that. But we are. there is never going to be a time that you're going to feel good about investing in real estate, right? Like there's never going to be a time that there's not a question of fear coming around the corner. Oh, 100%. Right? It's yes. always something scary coming around the corner. Always. To that, I've been in this since 2007. There's always been somebody shouting from the rooftop, usually Robert Kiyosaki, that the world's going to fall, yep. right? That's going to collapse. That and, there's all, the and, it's, and it's comforting to hear that. Yep. Because it, it affirms our fear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the reality is we don't know. So the best you can do is you can find a good horse and bet on the bet on the best jockey and the best horse you can find and maybe spread the risk a little bit among multiple multiple deals or multiple uh, people. Yeah, but if you're going to invest in something, I, I like investing in real estate the most because yes, if my stock portfolio dips, if my uh, crypto dips, if my NFTs dip, if whatever I put my money in goes down, I'm not getting rent paid. Yeah. They, they can weather that storm so that I can bounce back. So yeah. Real estate yeah. ends up being the best offensively and defensively when it you does. look at it. Yeah. And what I like about real estate is it's not going to go to zero. It's, uh, I mean, almost for sure not going to go to zero. And, and so business could, stocks could, you invest yeah. in your brother in law's startup, it's going to go to zero almost for sure. All this can go to zero. But real estate, it just, as long as you can hold it long enough. So this is the final tip I have for everybody right now in this economy right now, whether you're raising capital, whether you're thinking about investing in somebody else's deal, whatever. The debt matters now more than ever before. That's where you're going to lose is with bad debt. And really, it's at, it's any market. The way you lose is bad debt. And what I mean by bad debt, I mean is loans that are maybe riskier, that mm-hmm. are adjustable rate and a level you can't handle, that are short term. There's going to be a massive problem in the coming years. This is a whole different conversation. But with uh, all the bridge debt, which is short term debt that went on commercial real estate over the past five, six yeah. years, it's all come and due. Those people can't refinance. They're in trouble. The debt is what's going to sink people. Dave Ramsey has been preaching this for years. Now his answer is no debt. Mm-hmm. Mine is be very cognizant of the debt that you're doing or that the investor that you're investing with is doing. So um, yeah, pay attention to the length of time. Like the more time you have, the the all like the less risky it is. You get a 30 year loan, it's really hard to screw that up. You get a 30 year loan with some cash flow, it's really yes. hard to screw that up. Right. Um avoid a cocaine addiction and you're probably gonna be okay. Yeah, you're gonna be fine. Yeah. yeah. So like real estate's it's given enough time, you're gonna be fine. In fact, we just recently changed our whole model at Open Door Capital, where almost every deal we do now is what we call a generational wealth fund. Because we were looking at the market, we're like, I don't like the risk. Let's just pull back and say every deal we buy now, generally speaking, we will do some one-offs that aren't this way. We're going to hold forever, like forever. There's no end date. There's no end date. And we just tell our investors, hey, invest with us. We're going to, you get all the cash flow, all the cash flow until you get a hundred percent of your money back through refinances. At that point, we split everything, not 50, 50, like we give them more than we usually do 70, 30. So they get like 70%. So in other words, you get all the cash flow until we refinance it someday until like get your money back. And then you stay in the deal for the rest of your life, forever. We don't sell, we don't plan, infinite return at that point, right? And we get the longest debt we can get. We try to get 30 year debt all day long. There's no, it just takes all the risk down. And is the return less than if we were to like go flip apartments every six months? Sure. If we want to flip apartments, get really risky, low debt that, you know, or, or really risky, high leverage debt that we have one year to get a property and turn around and flip it, that's, you're going to get a better return, guaranteed. And so- you know, there are people doing that. If that's what, if that's your game, go do it. What I want is I want consistency. I want low risk. So I want really good, solid, stable debt for the long haul. 
And that's my advice for anybody in real estate right now is look for the long, play the long game. All right. Next question here. Brendan, you're an expert and relentless marketer, podcast, video content all around you, and you help build the foundation of what Bigger Pockets is today. You also grew your own brand and several social accounts along the way. What is the status of the competition that you had with Investor Girl Brit to get to 300,000 followers? Is there a winner? Have debts been paid and are there new bets to be made? Great question. So by the way, so we did rate in investor girl, Britt and I raced to a hundred thousand originally. She won. Then we raced to 200,000. She won. Uh, today. Oh, and then we set the bet, but we didn't set it at 300 actually. So the, 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 the bet is 500,000. Uh, we wanted more time to build up here. And I don't want to lose again. So this time she is at 259,000 followers and I am at more than that. 330, something like that. 330. But you didn't win because you didn't set the milestone at 300. You set it at 500. Correct. Which you and thought I would set be it. an advantage and actually Ooh, So what's you. the $300,000 milestone in your life, David, that uh, you should be setting? Instead, you were afraid and so you- I don't didn't. track shallow metrics like <laughs> followers, so I don't know. I, thought, I would track them if I was good at it. I'm at like 150, like Ooh, half of you. There you go. Well, let's talk Let's talk this for a minute. Uh, I think this is a very interesting point you just brought up. Shallow metric. Doors. Number of doors. Well, no, that's not where I was going, but maybe that is. <laughs> uh, Instagram, people might think social media is a vanity metric. Mm-hmm. Followers is a vanity metric. Oh, I see. Yeah, it, it's it not is, in our business. It is very tied yeah. to how much capital I can raise. Uh, is the amount, not a number of people who know, like, and trust me. Mm-hmm. How does somebody know, like, and trust me? They have to see you over and over and over. That's yep. why people like And they have people. to see patterns of consistency yep. in your message over and, and over and over. Your life. So show me a way to do that at scale other than social media, and I'll go do that, but it doesn't exist. Social media, TV, Point. that's it. But we own- Currency of the future part. is attention. Yep. Accru- it's agreed. even more important than dollars because dollars can be inflated. It's very yeah. difficult to inflate attention. Yeah, I spend, I don't know, if I had to guess, I'd spend half a million dollars a year on my team, like the team members that run mm-hmm. like everything from video to social to all that stuff. We probably spend a good chunk of money on that. Why? Because I'm trying to buy $10 billion of real estate. We're yeah. close, like By the time this episode airs, we'll be, I'll be just on the edge of a billion dollars of real estate. Like I got 10 times more to go. So what does that mean? I need 10 times more people to know, like, and trust me. I need to consistently find, you know, good deals. And this is the other thing with social media is the no- actually the number one reason to have social media is not to raise capital. It's to raise people, mm-hmm. right? Like the best people I have, the all my top people, I'm a who, not how guy, all my top people came from social media. They, they found followed, they found me. I mean, they listened to the podcast, which I would include in social media, but they found me on the podcast or they read my book maybe, but then they followed me on social media. They saw a pattern over time and now they, they uh, are working for me. Now people might be saying like, yeah, that's easy when you have 330. I didn't five years ago. I didn't 10 years ago. I started with zero, just like you would, just like everyone does. We all start with zero and I've been working it for a long time. And so it goes back to the idea that Jordan Harbinger told us on the podcast when we interviewed him back a few years ago. I don't remember what episode that was, but he used that line, dig your well before you're thirsty. Mm-hmm. Look, I don't care if you're raising capital right now, but someday you may want to raise capital. Someday you may want to bring an employee. Someday you may want whatever. Maybe now is the time to start focusing a little bit more on your social media. Well, I'm glad you're focusing on it because my best people come from you. So please continue. <laughs> now, re- remind me, what was the bet that you had with Brittany? What does the loser have oh, to do? Oh, man. Nickelback tattoo on the lower back. Now, was it a coincidence that you kind of look like the Nickelback guy? So like Brittany's going to have to get a tattoo Mm. that looks like you. This is how you remind me. You sound like him too. I do sound like him. We've talked about this before. Might as well do on the podcast. Is Nickelback as bad as the reputation? No, dude. Okay, so I was working out with Jerry uh, back like a year ago. He's our jujitsu instructor. Yeah, and we're working out. We put on. He's like, "What music do I listen to today?" I was like, "Let's put on Nickelback. That'll be funny, right?" So we play it, and we're like working out, and I'm like, "This song's awesome." I was like, "I forgot about this song." Then next song comes on, and we're like, "This song's great." Next song comes out for an hour and a half. Didn't repeat. Just song after song. Everyone was a freaking hit, and everyone was amazing. It's like the Taylor Swift of rock. And I'm like, "Do we hate them?" Because they're bad or do we hate them because they're good? That's deep. So what's the nickelback in your life? What's the nickelback in your life? Who are you looking down on because they're more successful? Because at the end of the day, you are jealous, whether you want to admit it or not, you're jealous of their success. So you're looking down on them. Is anybody out there listening to this going, I don't really like Brandon. Probably. Maybe you don't like my beard. Maybe you don't like my voice. That's very possible. But I know that for me, when I look at people and I don't like them, I can. it's almost always rooted in a, they expose something about you. It exposes you something, a hole in me that I'm that makes me feel like the bad guy. And a wise man once said, "No one wants to be the villain in their own story." 
<laughs> or what opinions have you formed because everybody else was saying it and you were mm, lazy and there you go. To listen to it yourself. Yep. Dude, that's a question right there. Like, oh, this doesn't work. Burr doesn't work. How second doesn't work? Subject two doesn't work. Or subject two works, Burr works. Or my, there's going to be another recession. There's going to be another estate. recession. Yeah. We love to take these shortcuts. It's easier just to rip on uh, Nickelback because, yeah, yeah, Nickelback is an incredible band. I was, I'm just, I was a little scared to say that out loud because I thought there might be an answer for why everybody hates them, but I couldn't understand why they're so hated. Paramore was another one. People were just ripping on Paramore and how bad their music was. And I'm not a huge, like, that type of music fan, but. They don't sound bad to me when I hear it. There is one small thing that has been known to plague you from early on in life about personal hygiene. Can you share what that is and if you have found a solution for it yet? <laughs> oh my gosh, bringing back from a long time ago. I had a youth pastor when I was like in sixth grade. She, Jody DeYoung, shout out to Jody. Uh, she said, hey guys, you realize that nobody ever cleans the middle of their back? <laughs> and I was like, because <gasps> you can't reach. There's like a one inch spot it's in the like middle of your back you part can't reach. It's like the windshield, the little train. Yes. That the windshield yep. wipers. So there is a one. Yes, that's exactly it. There's a little, <laughs> there's this little triangle angled spot on the back of you as well that has never seen soap a day in its life. Even uh, with your arms. You're yes, Mr. Fantastic. I've got some arms, but I cannot, cannot reach get all the way that one there. little spot right there. So, I mean, yeah, you could let the soap drip down. Mm -hmm. drip down. You could take a towel and maybe do this, but none of us do. Instead, we're all just gross. And uh, don't let anybody lick your back. It's disgusting. At least not that spot. Right? Not that spot. Lick yeah. the rest of it. Not I wonder that. if massage therapists know that and they avoid it. Like they just like take yeah. a detour around it every single time they get there. Yeah. The question I have for you though uh, is what is that little spot in your life? Uh, where in your real estate have you just been avoiding? Again, if you guys have ever wanted to know what it's like to be best friends with Brandon Turner, <laughs> it's that question on repeat on every repeat. single time that you Listen, try to man, talk. In your business, there is something that you just, you've been doing everything. You have these patterns in your life. You do the same thing every time you get in and you just do your thing. But there's one thing you've been avoiding and that's the part that's starting to stink, man. It's the part that you need to focus on because right now is the time to focus on that spot on your back. The bacterial dilemma. The Bacterial Dilemma by David Green. It's the new book. All right. Wow, we've Question got nowhere four. in this show. Great. I hope you guys are enjoying the nowhere run that we're, I mean, Seinfeld was a show about nothing and it uh -huh. did really well, right? It's a show about nothing too. But I guarantee you by the end of the show, you will be financially free or your money back. That's exactly right. <laughs> All that money that you paid us, you'll get it. At your All back. that money you paid us today to listen to this show. Next question. Where did our obsession with jujitsu, which we've already mentioned once, <laughs> unfortunately, begin? And who was responsible for the hundreds of mentions that our audience now has to endure? So episode number 300 and I like 365. Oh, I like that. Jocko was on episode 365. And you know, I've listened to Joe Rogan. I've listened to other people talking about jujitsu, Tim Kennedy and others. And it was always one of those like, yeah, that's a cool kind of mm -hmm. neat thing to be fun. And they say, you know, there's a lot of reasons to like jujitsu and Jocko did it. And I like Jocko and he gets on the podcast and I said to him, yeah, man, I would love to someday. Big mistake. Do jujitsu. Yeah. And as any good friend does, not that I can call Jocko a friend, though. He was a friend to you. He was a friend right, to who me. Who is my neighbor? And the story of the Good Samaritan is there you go. who do you choose to be a neighbor to? Yep. You know why? Because he said to me, someday, what day? And I'm like, uh, Yeah, he Brandon uh, Turner you is what he did. And I got to watch it in real time. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to go Monday. He's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go on Monday. I want you to text me on Tuesday and let me know that you went. So I show up on Monday. I've told the story before. I'm going to tell it real briefly now. I show up on Monday. I Googled. I'm like, okay, I know there's one of my towns. So I Googled uh, jujitsu in Kihei and there's a place. Um, I'm like, okay, great. So I drive over there during the day to go check it out and it's out of business. And I'm like, hmm. oh no. So I go back home. I Google again. Where's another one? It's like 40 minutes from my house. I'm like, shoot. So I go there uh, and I'm late. Uh, that night, because I had it was like Monday, so I go there and I'm like late. Nothing better there. than being the white late, guy in oh, Hawaii geez. that walks in late on their first day of a jujitsu class. And, That's like and a. This was in Wailuku. This is in like this is the local area, yeah. meaning like this is not where Tall Inky Brandon uh, shows up to jujitsu. You're walking in the five wolves den. Oh, and everyone's in a gi, and I'm not. And I walk in there, and I'm five minutes late. And there's a woman at the front desk sitting there, and there's there's thirty men looking strong and talking and doing like some warm up stuff and they're on the mat and I'm like hi and she's like can I help you and I'm like yeah I'd like to do jujitsu she goes today I, like yeah she goes <laughs> like here and I was like yeah and she goes what'd you google it or something <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> yeah she goes she like looks at me and she's like I don't um I, I, like you want to like you want to like do this and I'm like y yes like uh well, I don't I don't, I mean, uh, 
just go sit over there. And she points to this bench. And on this bench is three six-year-old kids, maybe five or six-year-old kids. And they're all just sitting there like playing video games on their iPads. She's like, just go sit over there. So I literally walk over there, all six foot five of me. And I sit down on this little kid bench. There's one kid to my left, two kids to my right. Never heard the detail of this. Story. Oh, and I sit there for an hour and a half. And I just watch these guys roll. The bench of shame. Yeah, the bench of shame. And I was so mortified every second. But you know what? That's what accountability does. I could. I was so scared mm. to walk in. I was so scared to, to go there. New place. Didn't know what was going on. Out of place. Didn't know what jujitsu was. Didn't have my gi. Didn't know what a gi was. And I'm sitting on the bench feeling like a moron. But I knew I was gonna have to report back to Jocko. That's why I'm such a fanatical about accountability. Because mm. that when you when I tell something to myself, I will lie to myself all day long. Yeah. When I tell something to somebody I respect that I'm gonna do something. I am going to do that thing. And this is why, you know, in the Better Life Tribe we have, we have like pods, right? Uh, Go Abundance has the same thing, pods. Hold each other accountable in a pod, whether you're in my group, whether you're in David's group, because you got them, um, you got you got accountability, I got accountability. Build accountability in your life if you want to see tremendous growth. So the story goes on, I leave quickly. As soon as it ends, I ran out and I was like, I that was terrible. Now I at least done a little bit, right? It's like the newbie going into real estate mm-hmm. and you go in and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to look like a moron. And you make an offer on a property that's completely like stupid. Or maybe you go to an open house and you don't even know what you're doing. And you walk out and you're like, that was dumb. I'm never going to do it again. And most people never go back. But you know, I got home and I'm like, all right, can't be worse than that. Mm-hmm. So I Google it again. I find another place. I was like, I'm not going to that one anymore. That was too awkward. <laughs> so I go to this other place. I Google it. Uh, <laughs> and two days later, I go to that one. I walk in. This time I walked in a little early. There's yeah, like four guys right. standing around. Gary, I'm like, better. I'm like, hey, what's up, everyone? And they looked at me and they're like, uh, can we help you? And I'm like, yeah, I was hoping to do some jujitsu. And they're like, literally said, would you Google it or something? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I Googled it. I'm like, what do I do? And I'm not kidding. The instructor points to the bench and he says, yeah, just go sit over there. And I go sit down again. And I watched the entire thing. And I just sat there and watched. But at some point at the very end, he's like, yeah, come over here and uh, stretch with us. And at the very end, I went and stri- did the ending stretch with them. Mm-hmm. And I showed up the next day. And that time I got to do the beginning stretch. Mm-hmm. And then I got to watch them roll. Mm-hmm. And the next time I did a little more. And the next time I did a little more. And before long, I was in jujitsu. Yeah. So long story short, there's such a great metaphor for life here in terms of a real estate. People want to get into real estate and they get scared and they don't show up. Or they get scared and they do show up and they do something stupid or they make a mistake and then they, they quit. But as Tony Horton from P90X fame would say at the end of every single episode of P90X, every single video, he'd say, hey, just keep pushing play. No matter what you feel, no matter what you're doing, you show up tomorrow and just press play. And that's my advice for people today. Trying Even to Brandon thing. Turner did not eat the whole thing in one bite. You mm-hmm. had to split it into several small bites and there kept showing up and went through some embarrassment, up. went through some shame, went through some humiliation, which is funny because they didn't directly humiliate you, but being told to sit on a bench with a bunch of six-year-olds while you watch everybody else yep. get to be cool. And then the real embarrassment starts when you actually go out there and start having to do it. Yes. Yeah. Right? Then you really get embarrassed, but then you're on the mat. Like then you're there. I'll give you one more, actually two more quick, very quick stories. I know uh, the, people are tired of jujitsu analogies. I'm walking through Costco. And I've told this on the show before, but I'm walking through Costco and I meet this guy who recognizes me from bigger pockets. What up? Shout out to you. If if you're listening right now. And he says, Hey man, I heard you doing jujitsu. I'm a black belt. I'm like, Oh cool, man. Uh, yeah, I've been doing it for about a, you know, six months now. Uh, I'm just a white belt. And he stops me. He goes, Hey man, you're not just a white belt. You're not just a white belt. He said, you know what? The white belt is the hardest belt to get. Mm-hmm. Now, for those who don't know, the white belt is the one they give you for showing up. Yeah. Like that's the beginner belt. And he said, 99% of people will never earn their white belt. Earn good point. their white belt, right? They give you the white belt but you got to show up. Oh yeah. How many of the people listening to this are looking at you, the black belt investor, Mm -hmm. I'm going to own a billion dollars of real estate and they're comparing themselves to you. And they're like, it's how we feel when we look at a black belt. I Mm -hmm. will never, ever, ever be them. And you know what the next thought is? So why show up? Yep. Why even try? Because they can't be them versus looking backwards and saying, look at all the people who don't know anything about real estate, yeah. who have no money saved up, who are actually in massive debt, yep. who, who don't know any path out of where they are other than just working that same job and hoping something external just magically finds them and changes their life that have no plan to find financial freedom. Yeah. But they're listening to this podcast and that's starting to be developed, right? There's some people that are listening like this, like the you on the bench with the six-year-olds that are watching what it looks like to do jujitsu and the neurons are being rearranged in their brain as they're starting to figure out what this thing looks like. That is progress. 
You don't have to be buying 700 doors a year for yep. it to be considered progress. You know, there's a man in Ireland back in the day who wanted to move a rock fence. You ever been to Ireland? They have these like rock fences. They're like not mortared or anything, just piles of rocks yeah. and they make the whole fence. And they hey, I had to move the fence from this side of the field to another side of the field. And so he goes over there, he grabs a rock, but you know, probably 20 pounds, let's say. And he takes the rock and he walks across the field and he sets the rock down. And then he walks back, grabs another rock, moves across the field, sets it down. And each of these rocks, let's say, weigh 20 pounds. And over the course of the day, he moves, we'll call it 10 rocks. Did that man move 200 pounds? Yes. Did he move 200 pounds at one time? Mm -hmm. No, he never had to move more than 20 pounds. And so oftentimes we look at the moving the wall. We look at this big project. Like I got to do this big thing. I got to get good at real estate. I got to build financial freedom. Let's take it back to the, the FF. I got to build this financial freedom. And it's a big wall. It's a lot of rocks there. It looks heavy. But the fact is, it's not heavy. It's 20 pound rocks. Anybody can do it. So maybe people need to focus a little bit less on the wall and more on the rock. Mm -hmm. so what's the next rock in front of you? What's the little, the 20 pound rock? It's not, it's not light. 20 pounds is still a little lift, but anybody can do it. A kid could do it. You just move the rock across the field. Yeah. Before you know it, you got a wall over there. You got a new fence. It's a great example. Thanks, You're not man. too bad at those. Thanks, man. Next question. We know that time with your family has always been a driving motivator. What's something else that real estate has afforded you? Ooh, uh, real estate has afforded me a luxury, ridiculously nice property where I live. You know, I talk a lot about uh, these 10 categories of life. It's like, you know, your spirituality, your finance, your career, your relationship. And But one of them I, uh, out of the 10, and we do like this little project, the wheel of life, but one of them is uh, I call environment. Environment is the physical world around you. It's the car you drive, the house you live in, the office you go to work uh, mm -hmm. to every day. It's the physical world, the things you touch, see, hear, feel, all that every single day. And now happiness is not derived purely from your environment. You can be happy and living in the middle of nowhere in a terrible house and driving a terrible car and be perfectly happy. However, the more of your life categories that are on a scale of one to 10, closer to 10, the general better happiness I feel, the more fulfilled I feel. So real estate has allowed me to maximize my environment in a way that allows me more, again, doesn't just alone bring me happiness, but my environment brings me a lot of peace and enjoyment. Uh, I'm able to host people here all the time and I'm able to take my kids in the pool. I'm able to do a lot of things that I could not do when I lived in the rain of Grace Harbor because of real estate investing. And I'm not talking about the money of real estate. I'm talking about, I'm house hacking this house. Mm -hmm. I'm living in Hawaii uh, for cheaper than people live in Ohio. Yep. And that's the, that's the fact of the matter. I'm living in a $4 million house in Hawaii, cheaper than people live in Ohio because of real estate investing. So uh, hashtag house hacking. Such a great point. I love it. Because you asked the question, how do I do it? Not, can I do it? Technically, you asked the question, how can you do it? And then I answered you. Yeah, but you, you already know. knew it. <laughs> yeah, but you helped me understand that. Again, the power of accountability and friends that challenge you so thank you. You pushed me to my pleasure, house. man. Thanks for putting me in the position where I was able to talk to you. Wouldn't be on the podcast right now, even having those real estate conversations if it wasn't for you. you. And again, I'm also enjoying this $4 million house in Maui that I don't own myself. So mm. please keep doing what you're doing because <laughs> it definitely benefits me. I feel like we're shutting down, but we still have the famous four, don't we? Is that still a thing? Yeah, we're heading to that. Oh, okay. Good. Famous four. All right. Famous four. I get to ask you these questions. Question number one, what is your current favorite real estate book that is not your own? All right. Uh, this is a book and I know you ask the business book one next, but it's a business book, but it, there's a chapter on real estate. The book is called, uh, shoot, uh, Keith Cunningham, The Road Less Stupid. <laughs> Uh, and it's a, I've been told by multiple people to read it. Chapter 10 in The Road Less Stupid is probably the single greatest chapter of any book I've ever read in wow. terms of real estate. Because- You read did, a lot of books too. I read a lot of books. Here's what happened. He went bankrupt back in the 80s. The whole real estate thing, just like Dave Ramsey had the trouble. Like, is that whole world of real estate changed in the late 80s? And a lot of people went bankrupt. So what him and all his buddies were all millionaires that all went bankrupt, sat down and said, let's make a list of every single les lesson we learned. Mm. And they just wrote a list. He just took that That's list good. and the whole chapter is simply, it's like a hundred lessons of somebody who had come just out of a collapse. And so reading this, I was taking a pen and I'm pretty much every single line I underlined as like, oh, I need to know this. This is great. It's concentrated all wisdom. Concentrated wisdom from multiple people in real estate. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, 
And it's all common sense stuff, but it's stuff that you need to hear. Just mm-hmm. stuff about um, being greedy, uh, going too fast. But that's what fundamentals that's, are. Yeah, it's fundamentals. And yep. you have to be reminded of fundamentals all the yeah. time. Yeah, it was a really good chapter. I read it a really good Something time. Something I like about you, you do put the fun in fundamentals. I put the so, fun. Because you're entertaining. I would say I put the fun in fund. <laughs> yes, you do. Open door capital. We put the fun in fund. <laughs> all right. Question number two. What is your favorite business book? Business book. Um, Man. Favorite's a hard one. Uh, I'm going to go with, I think I will go with the one thing. Um, I really like the one thing. I've been hanging out with, you know, Jay Papazen here in Hawaii because he was a keynote for the Better Life Real Estate Investing Summit. But um, I really like the one thing. When I read that book, uh, I don't know if I've talked about this. I probably have. But when I read that book, first of all, it was the only book I've ever read where I finished page, you know, whatever, 250, whatever the last page is. And then I went and turned back to page one and I read it again. I read it twice in a row. And then I had this epiphany. I said, the idea of the one thing is like, what's the one thing you can do that if you just did that, everything else becomes easier or not, you know, like not needed mm-hmm. basically. And I said, if I could just get this concept and the concept in this book into my thick skull, if I could just really internalize this, uh, my life would be completely different. Everything else would be easier. In fact, the book, the one thing is the one thing. And so I said, instead of reading 20 books this year or 30 books this year, I'm going to read one book 20 times. And I went and read the one thing. I think 20 times hmm. I put it on audible and this for the rest of the year, the whole year, that's pretty much all I read was the one thing I'd go for walks. It was when I was like running a lot. So I just go for a run and I just listened to an hour of the one thing every day. And I just kept listening over and over and over. I told that to Jay and he probably thought I was a stalker, but, uh, and then I look at where I'm at today and I'm like, it's so many of the lessons in that book. Uh, in fact, just sitting with Jay at a table this weekend, I was like talking, just, you know, we're just BSing and telling stories. And there were like three different times where I was like, wait, I think that story was in the one thing. And you yep. like laugh, Mick. Yeah. So like, I like so much of what I do and say and teach just came from that book. So the one thing, Jay Papazan and Gary Keller. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about that same principle about uh, read the word, meditate on the word, like drill it into your forehead, mm-hmm. like make it so it's like so ingrained in who yeah. you are that you don't have to think to try to remember. It is a part of you. Uh, that sounds like exactly what you did with the one thing. And when it comes to wisdom, that is a really good idea. It acts as a compass that guides you when you feel lost, when you get confused. You're less likely to stray away from the the path, so to speak, when you've got that software downloaded into you. There's a great quote from Bruce Lee that says, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. That quote is in Burr. Is it? Yep. What does that mean to you? It's uh, repetition. It creates mastery. That's the way that I use it. That's why I talked about Bruce Lee so many times. You don't get good at anything doing it once or twice a year or once every three or four years, which is how most people buy real estate. You have to do it a lot if you want to be good at it, just like anything else. And so there's always a new shiny thing. It's nice to say, I know 10,000 different kicks, look what I can do. But uh, to do one kick 10,000 times is how you become a master of it, which makes you a more feared opponent. Moving on. Question number three, what is one habit or trait you have picked up lately? That's like my question and I don't even know. Um, Tennis. Hmm. I'm going to go tennis. And I've actually kind of stopped the last few months as I got in the gym instead. But for the last year, I did a lot. I got a tennis membership and I started playing tennis. Why? Because I wanted something I could do with my wife. Uh, so, and she had friends that were playing tennis. So I said, okay, let's do tennis. So we started playing together uh, and it was fun. We were having a good time. I'm going to likely switch over to pickleball and try that. I've not played yet, but- Such a follower. P- I know people just say, here's my problem with pickleball. It's always been, I never saw somebody have a sweat playing pickleball. No one has a sweat playing pickleball. It's always like, oh, boop, yeah. boop, right? But then I met an actual like professional pickleball player. He's like- Pickleballer? We- pickleballer. I met a professional pickleballer and he's like- super in shape. And he's like, dude, no, pickleball is like intense. It's like racquetball, but you can play it outside Mm. anywhere you want. I mean, all over the place. And that's what convinced me because I'm a racquetball player through and through. I love racquetball with all my heart, soul, and mind. I love it. Yeah. You've always loved it. Always loved it. There's just, there's one place on the island to do. In fact, I'm building, I'm going to build a co-working spot in Maui where we're actually working on it right now. We're, uh, to buy land, we're gonna build a big co-working spot. And I'm gonna put a pickleball. I mean, a, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna put a racquetball court in it because there's nothing else. So I'm gonna I'm gonna house hack my racquetball court. Uh, and if you're a member of the co-working spot, you can therefore use the uh, racquetball court. And this will be uh, interest you. I'm gonna put the bottom bottom. The, you know, like pickleball or racquetball courts are made up of all those like four by eight panels all over. The bottom whole level I'm gonna have on hinges that swing up, and inside will be mats. Oh, that's and cool. then you can roll them out, and you have a right. jujitsu gym as well. So I can rent it out to jujitsu academies. Mm-hmm. Or have one hosted there. 
and then we can just roll it back up and back to a racquetball court. So you can reserve the court for either racquetball or uh, jujitsu, martial arts. Brandon Turner idea right there. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm literally house hacking an office because I need an office. I need a better studio than this. And I'm like, I don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, by, I'm, we're doing a $16 million development project right now. And we're going to raise capital for it. We're going to do the whole thing. And it's going to be so I can have an office. But the returns are actually stupid because uh, there's a big need for that here. Awesome, man. Anyway, so that's very cool to hear I'm that. Working on. All right. Question number four. What is one of your favorite things about me? About you? That is not a question. <laughs> what the producer put in there. <laughs> that's all. Oh, that's okay. Uh, your analogies are pretty great. You show up when I ask you to. And when I, when I ask for a favor, you have never said no ever. Uh, you encourage me a lot and other people. Uh, you're very good at encouraging. Uh, that is maybe a gift you have, which is you see the best in people and then you call it out on them, but you also see room for improvement and call that out on them. And that's what a true friend does. So thanks, man. Thank Not you. Not bad at all. Appreciate that. Not my hair, huh? I was going to say the beard's looking pretty nice. But. They, I'm, I, dude, it's harder to grow longer than I thought. It's mm. taking, I just thought it would like sprout right out. It's got to this point and then stopped. You got to eat more carrots or something. Okay. Is that a thing? We got to talk about that. <laughs> I was wondering if it was like a beard oil thing. Question number five, tell us where people can find out more about you. I am an Instagram nerd. So Beardy Brandon, Beard with a Y, Beardy Y. But now I used to say Beardy Brandon, Beard with a Y. People are like, okay, that's B-Y-R-D. I'm like, uh. Beard <laughs> Y. Think Spanish, like Beard E Brandon. It's like Beard and Brandon. Beardy Brandon on Instagram, TikTok, uh, all that stuff. Uh, the podcast is A Better Life with Brandon Turner. We hit number 40 of all podcasts in the world when nice, we launched. Man. That was awesome. Uh, it's not there now, but it was. Um we have a traveling podcast. So I travel around the country and I record people. And that's been a wild adventure uh, to do that. We'll like fly into a city and record seven podcasts at one time over a three-day period with no sleep. And we go out with the guests afterwards. And it's been an adventure. But man, it's been fun. So that's uh, that's it. A Better Life of Ben Tanner. Go to listen to the podcast. And you were on it. So go listen to that episode, everyone. It was actually... I heard multiple people say that when you and I were chatting on... We did a live podcast recording. Then we followed it up with a little interview after. But when we did the live one... Almost everybody I talked to said that was the best part of the entire conference that I held uh, and that it was the best thing that you and I have done together. Hmm. Like People thought it was one of the best things you and I. Now, I think this interview might uh, was pretty darn awesome, but go listen. All right. You got a lot going on, man. You've not been resting on your laurels. That's for sure. Very cool to see this and cool to see that the vision is still firing even faster than it was. Pew, pew. We're doing our stuff together. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. Please go check out Brandon all over the place and uh, send him a message. Let him know what you thought about this show. We'll let you get out of here because you've been sitting down for a long time. This is David Green for Beardy Pew Pew Brandon <laughs> signing off. All right. That was the first half of my conversation with Brandon Turner. We're about to get into another conversation that isn't seen green style, but it's still going to be fascinating. We're going to talk about the five episodes on Bigger Pockets that had the biggest impact on both of us. You don't want to miss it. So check out that episode next. <laughs>